Exodus chapter number 12, a hallmark chapter in the Old Testament. If it wasn't for Exodus chapter 12, there'd be no hope for you and I. Wasn't for Exodus chapter number 12, there'd been no Passover feast, which means there'd been no crucifixion, which means there'd be no Easter, because there'd be no resurrection. Without Exodus chapter 12, there'd be no hope for us. We'd all died and went to hell. We'll begin reading verse number 3. The Bible says... Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, and boy, I'd like to preach on too much lamb right about now, let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the number of the souls, Every man, according to his eating, shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. Ye shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats, and ye shall keep it up until the fourteenth day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. And they shall take... The, of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door posts of the houses wherein they shall eat it. Now look down verse 12. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt I will ex- execute judgment. I am the Lord. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. Let's pray. Our Father, we bless you. We certainly thank you for what we've already felt in the house of God this morning. Thank you for your presence. Thank you, Lord, for your peace. Thank you, Lord, for your touch. We're thankful for your people. We're thankful for your choice blessings, for daily you load us us with benefit. Lord, we're thankful for the health to be able to come out to the house of God. Lord, we're thankful for the hope we have in Jesus Christ. Lord, we're thankful to be able to stand and proclaim your precious word once again. Now, fathers, we stand here today. Lord, our soul is excited about the goodness of God. But our heart is troubled knowing that in our midst today there may be some who are not ready to meet you. And Father, I pray before the final amen of this service that cannot be said. And Lord, I pray that you do work now. I pray for the presence and power of God like we've never seen. And I pray for Holy Ghost conviction. And I pray for Holy Ghost conversion. Father, I pray you'd sit down amongst us, touch hearts, Help people where they are to aspire to be where you are. And Father, I pray you do great and mighty things which we know is not. Thank you for love that will not stop. Lord, even so, even though there are some who when you walked among men, they rejected you and they're in hell today, even though there are some who blaspheme you, even though there are some uh, uh, today who cuss you and are not concerned about you, uh, even those in hell, even those on the earth that blaspheme you, you still love them because you are love. Uh, Now, Father, I pray you'd help us today. And Lord, we'll bless you for what you do. Use this unworthy vessel, get glory to your name. We'll thank you for it. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. This is not the message, but in verse number 3, you find a lamb. In verse number 4, you find the lamb. But what's important is verse number 5, is he your lamb? Hmm? The book of Exodus is a book that shows God's delivering power. As we find in Exodus, uh, 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 we find persecution amongst God's people. In Exodus chapter 3, verse number 7, the Bible says, And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt, and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, uh, 
for I know their sorrows. Uh, as we sit here today, uh, I've got news for you. God knows. He knows. Uh, 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 Israel had been under bondage and in persecution for some 400 years, uh, but God knew where they were. Uh, God knew exactly when uh, he needed to come and to bring them out of Egypt. Uh, can I say that Israel was in captivity? Uh, Israel was being controlled, uh, and Israel had no comfort. Uh, 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 they were in despair. Uh, they were disturbed. Uh, they were depressed. Uh, they were a broken people. Uh, as you sit here today, uh, my dear friends, you may be held captive by sin. Uh, you may be held captive by shame. Uh, you may be being controlled by something. Uh, but I've got news. Uh, uh, if God delivered Egypt after 400 years of bondage, He can deliver you. Uh, we see there was persecution. I want you to notice that God sent plagues uh, unto Israel uh, uh, in the land of Egypt. Uh, in verse number 13, and uh, uh, he said this, And the blood uh, uh, shall be to you for a token upon the houses uh, where you are. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. Here it is. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. Uh, we find in verse 12 that he said uh, he was sending the plagues against all the gods of Egypt. God sent ten plagues uh, into uh, uh, the land of Egypt uh, in these uh, uh, days that uh, Israel was held captive. God sent a deliverer Moses. Uh, Moses told Pharaoh to let God's people go. Uh, when Moses, uh, his heart was hardened uh, and he would not allow him, God sent uh, the plagues. Now let me help you with something. Uh, God's the one that hardened Pharaoh's heart. Uh, God wanted to make certain that when his people came out of Egypt, uh, everybody knew it was the hand of the God that did it. Uh, and God sent plagues to attack the very gods of Egypt. Let me give you what the plagues were. Can I say this? Uh, 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 God sent uh, 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 the plague where he turned the river into blood for seven days. That plague was against uh, uh, the Nile River god named Hapai. Uh, uh, can I say that God sent uh, uh, frogs uh, into the land? Uh, you'll find in Psalms uh, 105 that even frogs got in the king's chamber. Uh, 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 can I say God sent uh, uh, frogs, the plague of frogs, because they had a frog goddess named Hect. Uh, uh, can I say that two times God uh, sent lice uh, and he sent flies? Uh, you can have both of them. Uh, hey, how many remember when you had a fly swatter? Three of us, huh? Huh? Listen, uh, they had lice uh, and they had pl uh, 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 flies. Uh, they had to cut all their hair off and swat flies. Uh, why did they, God do that? Uh, uh, to attack uh, uh, and show that uh, uh, the Egyptian earth god uh, was powerless. Uh, his name was Seb. Uh, he was supposed to be the protector against things that came out of the ground. Uh, uh, can I say this? Uh, uh, God sent a plague and destroyed all the cattle of Egypt. Uh, now if you study the Bible, Bible uh, he didn't destroy the cattle of, uh, of Israel, uh, but the cattle of Egypt. Uh, why did he do that? Uh, uh, because uh, uh, Egypt had a mother goddess uh, named Hathor, uh, uh, which had the head of a cow. If you've ever seen any movie uh, depicting Egypt and depicting Pharaohs, uh, uh, look in the background. There's always a statue with a figure of a man that has a cow's head on it. Uh, that's Hathor. God destroyed Hathor. Can I say this? Uh, God sent, uh, uh, my dear friend, a plague of boils uh, that fell on man and beast. Uh, 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 that was against uh, uh, their god, Imhotep, uh, which was the god of medicine. Uh, once again, God sent uh, uh, locusts, and he sent hailfire, uh, uh, two more plagues. Uh, uh, why? Because they had a goddess of the sky named Nut, uh, and God sent that uh, hailfire, uh, and, and he sent those locusts from the sky to show their god was powerless. Uh, but God is all powerful. Uh, my dear friends, uh, 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 then God sent darkness on the face of Egypt for three days and three nights. Uh, uh, why? Uh, uh, because they had a God uh, uh, by the name of Horus that was the sun God. Uh, and God just showed them uh, uh, their sun God uh, had no power because God turned the lights out. Uh, and can I say this? Uh, 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 they still worship the sun. Uh, some worship him on the, God, on the coast at the beach. Uh, but I'm going to tell you, you go to any Catholic temple, uh, and you go to any pagan religion and they'll always have a son somewhere in there. 
Hmm? Why? They worship Horus. Hmm? And I'm glad I worship the S-O-N. Duh. And then, my dear friends, the final plague God sent in Exodus chapter 12 where he destroyed the firstborn of man and beast. That was against Amnery. Amnery was the god of the firstborn. So God showed Israel that he was more powerful than the gods of Egypt. God showed Egypt their gods were powerless. And when Pharaoh let God's people go, they not only left and left captivity, they left with all the spoils of Egypt. They took all the gold and silver and jewels and everything Egypt had. They left without ever firing a shot because God did the fighting for them. Can I say this book of Exodus shows his delivering power. We see that we're under persecution. We see God sent plagues. But notice God's provision in verse 13. It says, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. God told them to take a lamb, set him up for 14 days, make sure he's without spot, without blemish, and then slay the lamb and put the blood over the doorpost and lintel of your house. He said, I'm sending a death angel down there. There's a plague to destroy all the firstborn. He said, when I see the blood, I'll pass over you. Can I help you with something? If he didn't see the blood, it didn't matter if they was an Israelite or if they was an Egyptian. Death came to that home. Can I say, in God's provisions, he made a way out. Hmm? Look again at verse 13. I want you to see it. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where you are. He made a way out. Hebrews 9.22 says, and, and almost all things are by the law purged with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. That is so important for you and I, friends. Because if Jesus, the Lamb, isn't your Lamb, you're in trouble. But he can't be your lamb because he was the lamb of God and on the cross of Calvary he shed his blood uh, to be the propitiation for your sin and my sin. We see God made a way out for them. Can I say this? God made a way forward. Look again at verse 13. He said, uh, And the blood shall be for you a token upon the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. They not only had a way out, they had a way forward. They had a way that gave them a future. They had a way that would deliver them out of every problem they'd ever had. They had a way forward. You know, there's a lot of people in this life that don't see that there is a way out. And they have no hope of progressing any farther than they are. And I say, if all you have in, in this, uh, for all of your life is what you have in this life, you are a miserable person. Because everything in this life is fleeing away. But I'm glad I got a way forward. I'm glad I had a way out. But then he gives them a way up. Look again at verse 13. He says this, uh, And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. Can I help you with something? I'll get to it in a second, but everybody has a death sentence on them. And after this life is over, there's only two ways you can go. Up or to the lake of fire. I'm glad because of the blood I've got a way up. Hmm? You see, back in Genesis, they tried to, in Babylon, build a tower to heaven. They couldn't get there. There's been people try to build many ways to heaven. Well, if I, I do enough good works, if I give money, if I get baptized, if I belong to a church, uh, if, if, I, if I'm good, if I do all these things, then God will let me into heaven. My dear friend, there's only one way up. And that's through the blood of Jesus Christ. Uh, now listen. Many today are being held captive. Some are being held captive by sin. 
That's not a popular t topic. People get mad when I preach on sin. I got good news for you. The middle letter of sin is I. That's your problem. You got an I problem. Some people are held captive by addictions. They just seem they seemingly uh, go through cycles where they think they can get better and they start getting better and they fall back into the same problems over and over and over again. They're held captive by it. Some are held captive by relationships. They're in a bad relationship and they don't see any way out. Can I help you something? The best relationship you can ever have is one with God. Some are held captive by religion. Can I help you something? Religion does not bring salvation. All religion does is bring damnation. It'll hold you. It'll bind you. It'll keep you from God. Jesus Christ didn't come to establish religion. He come to establish a relationship uh, and a way out. Uh, he come to be your Savior. He didn't come to be your keeper. Hmm? Some are held captive. Many today are being controlled. Many today are being controlled by fear. We've seen that in our country in the last year. People are scared to death. I want to tell you something. You've got a real fear problem if you're driving around in your car by yourself and wearing a mask. You've got a real problem. If your car is that bad, trade it in, get something better. Or at least change the cabin filter in the thing. Huh? And if that's bad enough, I see them walking down the street, ain't nobody within 40 miles of them on a sidewalk by themselves wearing a mask. I mean, unless you're walking in front of a Chinese restaurant, because that odor stinks, unless you're doing that, that's the only time you need to have your nose covered, huh? People, people, I'm telling you, people are being controlled by fear. Can I say this? People are being controlled by disinformation. People believe a lie, hook, line, and sinker before they believe the truth. People are being controlled by debt. Some people can't live a life of joy and peace because they're living under debt. That's what's wrong with America. America has a debt that she's never going to be able to repay. And it's controlling America. It's controlling our congressmen. That's all I'm going to say about that today. Mm -hmm. And I say there are people who are controlled by pleasures. You know, the Bible says that there's pleasures in sin for a season. There is the thrill of the moment in anything you get involved in. The problem is, is somebody wrote a song, sang it back in the 70s, the thrill is gone. It only lasts for a little time. I remember back in the 80s, there was a fellow by the name of Huey Lewis. Well, Brandon, did you know our cousin Sherry cut his hair? Yeah. Huey Lewis. Remember him? Huey Lewis in the news? You know why I liked Huey Lewis in the news? Because he had a band. They had the horns. I loved the horns. That's why I liked Elvis. Had the band. Had the orchestra. Had the horns. I mean, man, good to do it. Huh? Wayne Newton has the horns. Huh? Nowadays, they, they, they just got a tape they put in there. They don't even have bands anymore. But Huey Lewis sang a song, I Want a New Drug. You know why? Because the old one only sustains you so long. And they're seeking for something else, a new high, a new kick, a new pleasure to bring some kind of satisfaction to their life. The problem is it don't last long. It's temporary. There are people controlled by that. People who are held captive, they're controlled. Many today are comfortless. They have no comfort. They have no peace. They put their head on their pillow at night and they're worried about everything. They have no joy. They're constantly just living their life without any expression of hope. They feel unloved. And I say, everybody, I don't care what they say, even hermits, even chief, he's a hermit. But you talk to him, he loves people. Everybody is seeking love, and everybody is seeking acceptance. Everybody wants that. They want that nurture in their life. But yet, there are many people that have no comfort. They feel like nobody loves them. Well, that's not true. We have already sung about it. We've already mentioned God loves you. And I've got good news for you. God's people love you. You say, God's people don't even know me. It don't matter. Because Jesus loves you, they love you. You say, well, they don't know what I've done. They don't care. Hmm? 
Because you don't know what God delivered us from. There are people who are comfortless because they feel unfulfilled. Feel like their life has been a waste. Feel like all they do is get up, go to work, come home, go to bed. Get up, go to work, go home, go to bed, pay your taxes. That's all they feel like they do. Hmm? Can I say just as God rescued Israel back then, He's ready to do the same for you today. I'm going to preach with God's help on this thought this morning. I'm going to preach on divine deliverance. See, when God delivers you, delivers you, it's not only divine, but it's true deliverance. He didn't deliver Israel to put them back under bondage. He delivered them and took them to Canaan land, a land flowing with milk and honey. And I've got good news for you. He has a Canaan land for you. He has one in this life and one for the life to come. Jesus said, I am come to give you life and life more abundantly. You can have an abundant life now and a greater abundant life when you spend it with Him in eternity. Can I say God's divine deliverance comes through a process. And I'm going to give you the process this morning. Can I say the process of God's divine deliverance begins with beckoning. The Bible says in John 6, by the way, I'm going to give you a lot of Bible this morning because I don't want your faith to stand in what Brother Doug said. The Bible says, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And I want your faith to stand in what God said. But in order for God's process to begin, it begins with beckoning. John 6, says this, No man can come to me except the Father which has sent me, draw him, and I will raise him up in the last day. And Jesus is talking to a bunch of very religious men, and they're not getting what he says. And he tells them, you can't even come to me unless the Father that sent me draws you. Can I say, no one will ever be a recipient of God's deliverance until God lets them know that they need to be delivered. He beckons you. Now you don't understand it, but He puts something in you that tells you you need Him. Now it's different for a lot of people. Some people wake up one day in a hog pen. They've wasted their life and they're in a hog pen. They realize they had it much better before they left their homeland but they've got there in the hog pen, they're sick of the hog pen, they're sick of their life, they're sick of everything around them, and they make up their mind, they're getting out of the hog pen, and they're headed toward the Father. Uh, you don't realize that God's the one that woke you up in the hog pen. Uh, some wake up with a needle in their arm, some wake up with a bottle in their hand, some sit on a church pew from the day they're born, uh, and they realize, uh, I've just been going through the motions, uh, I need the Lord. Uh, he beckons you. Sometimes He puts somebody in your life. Maybe it's at a restaurant where you eat. Uh, maybe it's somebody who gives you a gospel track. Uh, uh, maybe it's your neighbor. Maybe it's somebody you met who just has something that you don't have. And God begins to work in your life. You see, we have so spiritualized what we call Holy Ghost conviction. I've heard preachers say, unless you've seen yourself hanging over hell, you can't get saved. That's not true. All you need to do is realize you need God. And you know who gave you that thought? Him. Because the Bible says we didn't even retain God in our knowledge. We had no idea who God was or what He was about. We were just living life. till God began to beckon us. You see, because after He beckons you, you start asking questions. Let me give you some examples from the Word of God. Mark chapter 10 verse 17 says, And when he was gone forth into the way, there came one running, and kneeled to him, and asked him, Good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? This rich young ruler, uh, 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 as concerning the law, you couldn't touch his life. He was squeaky clean. But he knew something was missing inside. Uh, and he looked at Jesus and he said, What must I do that I might inherit eternal life? What must I do to go to heaven? He asked a question. In Luke 10, 25, the Bible says, And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He's trying to make a mockery of Jesus, saying, Well, what do you got to do then to go to heaven? Well, he might have mocked in the question, but he didn't like the answer. 
Hmm? Can I say this in Acts 16, uh, uh, verse 30, uh, 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 when uh, 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 the fellow had witnessed a great earthquake and Paul and Silas in prison uh, and uh, uh, they'd been beaten within an inch of their life instead of moaning and complaining, all they're doing is singing and praising Jesus. Uh, God sends an earthquake, breaks open the prison. Uh, 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 he's about ready to kill himself. And Paul said, why hurt you? He said, we're all here. And after witnessing all that God had done in Paul and Silas's life, he asked this question. He said, and he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Hmm. You see, when God beckons you, you begin to ask questions concerning God. How do I get to know Him? Hmm. You see, the process of God's deliverance begins with beckoning. Then the process continues by you becoming blamable. See, when you don't think you need God, you think you're living above other people. You get, begin thinking you're okay. You start to uh, reassess and talk about all the things you've done that should impress God. Well, let me help you with something, honey. God flung all them stars out there you'll see in the sky tonight, and he called them all by name. God's the one that causes the sun to come up and go down every day. God's the one that makes the grass grow, and God's the one that puts leaves on trees, and God's the one that feeds all the animal kingdom, and God's the one that forms a baby in the womb. Uh, uh, you think you're going to impress God with anything you do? He's not impressed by us. But you get to looking at him, you'll find you'll be greatly impressed with him. You see, we've got to become blamable. See, we'll pick out somebody like Adolf Hitler. We'll say, oh, what a tyrant, what a wicked man. Look at all them Jews he killed. Look at all oh, he's wicked. Oh, I, compared to him, I'm good. Well, you may be compared to him. But you're using the wrong yardstick. God measures goodness based on comparing yourself to him. And here's what the Bible says. In Romans chapter 3, verse 10, the Bible says, As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. The Bible says in Romans uh, 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 three twenty three, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Mm -mm. Matter of fact, the Bible says that all of our righteousness is as filthy rags. Go out to your garage or go down your basement. Get old nasty shop rag where you've changed your oil or you've you know you've cleaned up something nasty and and, and hold that out and look at it and compared to God that's all your goodness right there. Hmm. The Bible goes on to say this in Romans five twelve, wherefore as by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin so death passed upon all men for that all have sinned. You see, God's never sinned. But you and I were born into sin. Because Adam and Eve sinned, that sin was passed upon all of us. And by the way, had they not sinned, there'd never been a thing called death. I've had to hold the hands of people that's had a loved one pass away, and they say, Preacher, why, why, why? They don't like the answer. They died because of sin. See, we all have a death sentence on us. The angel of death's going to come by your door one night. Now, I'm not talking about your house door. I'm talking about the door of your heart. And he's looking for one thing, the blood of the lamb. With it, you're okay. Without it, you're in trouble. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. We're all headed for death. But the Bible says this. But God commended His love toward us, or He sent His love toward us. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Huh? Miss Melissa, the Bible says, for a good man, some would dare to die. But who would die for an old, sorry, no good sinner? Jesus. Don't matter what you did, don't no matter how far in sin you was, doesn't matter how wicked you were, and He loved you. And when Jesus, before the foundation of the world, realized when they made man, man would sin, and he looked and said, we're going to need a sacrifice to pay for their sins, Jesus said, I'll pay their price. Well, he saw that filthy, no good mouth of yours and that sin and business you was in, and he said, I still love that boy, and I'll die for him. 
Hmm? He died for you, friend. And if you'd been the only one that would have put your faith in him and trusted him, he'd still died the death of the cross just for you. Because he loves you that much. Can I say, Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death. I'm glad the verse don't end there. It says, But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. You see, God gave the greatest gift that could ever be given. He gave himself. He gave his Son to die for you, a sinner. Hmm? You see, his process begins with beckoning. You realize that there's a God out there, and you need to know more about him. You begin to ask questions. What do I need to do to be saved? What do I need to do to get to go to heaven? What do I need to do to be right with the Lord? How can I have this relationship with God? Well, then you've got to realize you're blamable. See, no one will ever get found until they get lost no one will ever gets saved till they realize they need to be saved they're a sinner the process begins with beckoning then you've got to become bl blamable but then you've got to believe that same verse where Paul and Silas that Philippian jailer asked him sirs what must I do to be saved here's what their answer was Acts 16, 31. And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. Now, notice what it didn't say. Phil, it didn't say believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. A lot of people believe in the Lord. The Jews believed in the Lord. They said he was a good man. He was a rabbi. Hmm? Many have said he's a religious man. He was a prophet. He was a great teacher. Mm, you'd be hard-pressed to find anybody in America that don't believe in Jesus. I mean, every Christmas we celebrate and have little baby Jesus in the manger. A lot of people believe in him. The Bible says the devils believe and they fear and tremble. The devils aren't going to heaven. It's not enough to believe in him. You've got to believe on him. To believe on him you, it simply means when you realize you're a sinner, the only hope for your salvation is in him. You're no longer trusting in you go to church or your baptism uh, or uh, uh, your good deeds, how you've worked at a soup kitchen, how you've helped out the poor, how you've given money, uh, how you've been good to your neighbor. Uh, you realize you're a sinner and the only hope for you is the Lord Jesus Christ who died for you. Right. Right. Mm, you got to believe. Believe on Him. Believe that He's the only way. For you to go to heaven. Jesus said over there in John 14, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Romans chapter 10, verse number 9 says, That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. See, those that believe in Jesus have a head knowledge. Those that believe on the Lord Jesus have a heart knowledge. He takes resonant in your heart when you believe on Him. When you submit your will to His will. Hmm? When you become a sinner and He becomes the Savior and you believe on Him, my dear friends, that's when He takes up residency in your life. I like verse uh, 13 of Romans 10. Brother James wrote that song. I like it when he gets right with God and sings it every now and then. The Bible says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. He wrote that song, Whosoever Means Me. Hmm? Huh? Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Believing on Him, you'll call on Him. You'll ask Him to save you. And I like that word, whosoever, because there's a lot of people believe that only some can be saved. But the Bible says, whosoever can be saved. You know who whosoever is? Hmm, whoever is. And you realize you need to be saved. That's you. You can be saved. He died for you. Hmm? Ephesians 2.8 says, For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. See, if you could do something to get to go to heaven, then you could get there and brag, look what I've done to get here. 
But see, everybody going to heaven is going because of Jesus. That's why when we get there, we're all just going to brag on him. Acts 2.21 says this, And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. First, God beckons you. You start asking questions. And then you realize you're blamable. You're a sinner. Then you've got to believe. You've got to believe on the Lord. But then there comes the bemoaning or the repenting. A lot of people don't preach on repentance anymore. they got the believe part down. But there's a little bit more to it. What does the Bible say? In Mark 1, 5, it says, And there went out unto him all the land of Judea, and they of Jerusalem, and were all baptized of him, talking about John the Baptist, in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. See, to repent is to tell the Lord you're a sinner, and you need to be saved. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. I love these verses. The Apostle Paul said this, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. Paul said, I realized I was a sinner, and I received the Lord. I received the gift of salvation. That's why I'm giving it to you, because that's what I've got to give. You say, how can I be a witness, preacher? Just tell somebody what Jesus did for you. That's what Paul's about ready to do. Now look what he says. He said, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to, to the Scriptures. You see, that's the gospel. Jesus Christ died for our sins, was buried, and rose again. And you have to believe that he did that for your sin. You have to believe that he's the Savior and the only way of salvation. And you have to confess to him, Lord Jesus, I can't save myself, but I sure would love for you to save me. Because he's the only one who can. The Bible says in Luke 5, 32, I came not, this is Jesus speaking, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Luke 13, 3 says, I tell you nay, but except ye repent ye shall all likewise perish. Acts 3.19 Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Now how do you, how do you, how do you repent, preach? What does all this mean? How do you repent? Well, it's very simple. Acts 11.21 is a hallmark verse. It says, And the hand of the Lord was with them. He beckoned them. And a great number believed, they believed, and here it is, and turned to the Lord. See, it's one thing to believe, it's another thing to believe and turn unto the Lord. Repentance is a turning point. Repentance is turning your back on your life and what you've trusted in and everything else and turning to the Lord. Repentance is just simply saying, I'm sick of my life, I'm going to turn to Jesus. And when you and your heart turn and believe on Him, my dear friends, hallelujah day for you. Hmm? And you get born again. And that's the next part. In order for God's process to take part in your life, to deliver you from whatever you're being controlled by, whatever has uh, got you bound today. It starts with beckoning, then believing or then being blamable, then believing, then bemoaning. Then you get birthed. In John chapter 3, it's a great chapter. A lot of preaching in John 3. A religious man, a Pharisee, by the name of Nicodemus, comes to Jesus. Now let me stop right here. In order to be a Pharisee, you have to have the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch, committed to memory. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, they had, it, had to have it memorized. These men spent their life studying the law. Here is a great Bible scholar coming to Jesus. He calls him rabbi, and he asked the Lord. He, said, he says, no man can do the works that you do, except he be of God. Here's a religious man who has been beckoned by God, comes to God, begins to ask questions because he knows something's missing in his life. And this is what Jesus tells him in John 3, verse number 3. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. 
Verse number 7, he says, Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. In Ephesians 1.13, it, it just summarizes what being born again is. He says, In whom ye also trusted, you believed, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also that after ye believed ye were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. What happens when you get birthed into the family of God, the Holy Spirit of God does a miracle. He does something supernatural. He goes to your fleshly heart and he cuts away that wicked part and he moves in and he seals your life he seals your soul he births you into the family of God now uh, I forgot to announce but brother Jake and Miss Abby had to had their little boy and uh, he looks beautiful from the pictures Lord will now have him here maybe next week uh, but if you talk to Miss Abby, she'll be, she'll be cooing and gone all over that little one. That's about number 18 for them. <laughs> Jake from State Farm is now the Duggars, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> but anyway, you talk to her, though. She'll tell you about the travail in order to bring that baby forth. You see, all that I've rolled off my tongue that sounds so sweet, the beckoning and then the blamable realizing you're a sinner, and then believing, and then bemoaning and repenting. All of that's a process. And some of it hurts. When you've got to turn your back on things you've been taught from a little child to believe, and you realize you can't believe that and believe on Jesus, that hurts. When you realize, Brother Tony, if you believe on the Lord, some of your family is going to reject you, that hurts. When you realize that you are guilty of putting Jesus on the cross, that hurts. And that's a process. But when you get birthed into the family of God and the Holy Ghost seals you, there is a joy and a peace that comes in your life that you have never experienced that supersedes any of the problems you ever had. As soon as Miss Abby got that baby in her arms, uh, uh, she'd say, all oh, the travail was worth it. Uh, he's precious. He's wonderful. It's a blessing of the Lord. Uh, and friend, when you get in, it's wonderful is all I can tell you. You've got to be birthed into the family of God. And then, my dear friends, the final piece of the process is you become bold. Listen to what the Bible says. Now, I'm going to give you the Bible. I read one of these verses a minute ago, but I'm going to read it again. In Romans chapter 10, verse 8, the Bible says, But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. You're sitting here today, if you don't know Jesus, or you're without excuse. We've already told you how to be saved. The word is nigh you. All you got to do is act on it. The word of faith is there, and God's given you a measure of faith. You've just got to act on it. And then he said again in verse number 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Now listen, you can confess without possessing, but you can't po possess without confessing. If he moves in, you're going to tell somebody. That's one of the first evidences somebody got saved. They can't wait to tell others. I just met the Lord. Hmm? But then he goes on to say this. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. Again, it's a heart. We've got a great track out there on the table. It says, will you miss heaven by 18 inches from your head to your heart? A lot of people have it here, not here. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. And with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Here it is. For the scripture saith, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Folks that get born again, they're not afraid to tell folks, I've got born again. I've heard people say, well, I'm saved. I just don't want anybody to know about it. Well, you're not saved. Hmm. Now, I'm not going to tell you you're going to act like Brother Phil. Very few do. And can I say this? He didn't get any more in his salvation than anybody else got. He's just Dr. Phil. I mean, he just has, has gotten in that book, and he's just fallen in love with Jesus, and he's fallen in love with Jesus so much he don't really care who knows about it. But if Jesus moves in your heart and life through the Holy Spirit, you'll let people know. You won't be afraid to come in front of God's people and say, yeah, I just got born again. 
You know, if I ask somebody, do you mind if I tell the congregation you just got saved? And they say, well, I really don't want you to. Then it's not time for you to announce you got saved. Uh, the Bible says that there's rejoicing in the presence of the angels over one sinner that repenteth. If there's rejoicing in heaven when somebody gets born again, there ought to be rejoicing in God's house when somebody gets born again. Uh, but I promise you, if you get born again, you'll be rejoicing in your soul. Hmm? There's a boldness that comes with it. Now, let me say this before I'm, before I'm done. I've dealt with, with folks that don't know the Lord. You can be delivered. God's got a divine deliverance for you. He's no respecter of persons. The blood of Jesus Christ was shed for every man. Doesn't matter what color, what creed, don't matter how you was raised, don't matter what side of the tracks you're from, don't matter how much or how little you got, none of that matters with God. What matters is whether or not the blood's applied. You remember Exodus? See, when somebody gets born again, their sins get blotted out by the blood of Christ. And then when God looks at you, he no longer sees that sinner, Melissa Ross, that sorry, no good, you used to drive that dump truck lady. No. Remember when you used to drive that thing? You come in, shake our hands, jerk our arms out of socket. I said, don't mess with that chick, huh? huh? Now you've gotten old and soft. But see, when he sees you, he don't see Melissa Ross. He sees your sins have been blotted by the blood. He sees himself. You've been robed in his righteousness now. See, when, when you was just you, you was sinful. You was that filthy rag. But see, you've been saved. You've been washed. And now when he sees you, he sees you pure and holy. So he sees himself. That's the, view of, the beauty of it. And we've dealt with that with folks that don't know the Lord. But what about us that do know the Lord? From time to time, we need to be delivered from some things. Um, he made provision for the captive believer. In Galatians 5, 1, the Bible says, Stand fast, in the, in, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. And be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. But if you don't stand fast, and you don't stay in this book, you don't keep your nose in this book, you don't keep your eyes on Jesus, you may be tempted to become entangled in some yoke of bondage, whatever it may be. Can I say there is divine deliverance for you too? The divine deliverance is found in applying the Scriptures to your life. God just doesn't give the preacher a message for you to come, sit here, and get spit on, slobbered on, and go home and forget about it. When you come to church, God's given a message to help you. But it's just like going to the doctor. If you don't take your medicine, you're not going to get any help. You've got to apply the Scriptures. When you're reading the Scriptures and God puts His finger on something, you're guilty of you Apply it. Do what God says. And then you've got to appeal in supplication. You'll only be as strong as your prayer life is. The more you talk to God and the more you let Him talk to you through the Scriptures, the less you'll be in any kind of bondage in this world. Hmm? Can I help you something? Back when we had revival breakout over the summer, I quit watching any news. Quit watching Fox News. Quit watching any of the news. Miss Nett asked me the other day. She said, it's going to rain. I said, how would I know? I got tired of being lied to. I don't listen to any of that stuff. She said, well, I want to wash my car. I said, I guarantee you then it's going to rain. Because every time she washes her car, boom, skies open up. Remember that song, uh, that, that movie, The Little Rascals? Alfalfa's running. Said, and the heavens open up, and God said, I hate you, Alfalfa. Huh? Remember that? It's the best line in that movie. Huh? But Listen. If you're not careful, you won't apply and you won't talk to God and you'll get all tangled up. you get all jacked up. I quit watching the news. I quit watching sports. I couldn't tell you who won the World Series. Couldn't tell you who won the, uh, uh, the, uh, the NBA. Could care less about that crowd. I, I mean, I, I, I really don't know anything about football. I haven't watched. I, I watched about one quarter of Joe Burrow just to see if he was going to be the real deal in, in, in the pros, and then he gets hurt, so I was cursed him. You know, what can I say? But I, I just, because if you're not careful, you get so entangled with all of that, you put all your faith in that, your life will become a life of disappointment, despair. But if you start putting the things of God in your life and meditating on those things, it'll help you. A preacher that I met, he's out in Utah, he said this this past week, and man, it, it resonated. 
If you got an Apple phone, I don't know about Android, I don't have Android, but if you got an Apple phone, you can go on there and it'll tell you how much time you spent on that phone this week. He said that he got to look at that and he spent three hours and 15 minutes a day on average on his phone. Now he's a preacher, he's on the phone talking, but he's also on the phone checking news and on posting and all that stuff. He did the math. He said if he took them three hours and 15 minutes every day and applied it to the Word of God, he said he could read through his Bible 23 times in a year. Now I said this in my Sunday school class. We as Christians, we like to beat our chest, say God's going to judge America because of all the abortions, and he will. God's going to judge America because America has promoted liquor throughout the world. And God's going to judge America because of this. And God's going to judge America kicking him out of school, kicking prayer out of school. God's going to judge America. You know why God's going to judge America? Because Christians have been lazy and spent so much time on their phone and haven't been in the book. Had we been in the book applying messages, being the light to this world, a lot of the evils in America wouldn't have happened. If the church would have been the church, what it should be uh, uh, prior to the Great Depression, guess what? Uh, uh, if people would have tithed and given offering, been everything they should have been, the church would have brought America through the Great Depression. Uh, we wouldn't have welfare in America today if the church would have been the church. No, we don't like that kind of preaching. Uh, the truth of the matter is you're in bondage because of this. And God can deliver you. And then God can use you to make somebody else's life free from bondage. Divine deliverance is found in applying the scriptures and appealing in supplication and also in abandoning yourself to the Savior. Brother Bill Wongworth, you sing that old song, I'm a slave to the master. One of the great writers I loved reading about, Oswald Chambers, said this about being abandoned to Christ. He said, if we have not abandoned to Jesus Christ, we are likely to be trapped on every hand by our complete ignorance of ourselves. Now, how many times have you heard me tell you, you're your own worst enemy? He said, and panic will result. Panic leads us away from the control of God and leaves us not only beyond our own control, but possibly under the control of other forces. He only said this in 1915. He went on to say this. The only safeguard is abandonment to the Lord Jesus, receiving His Spirit and obeying Him. You want to be set free from whatever is controlling you, Christian? Just throw yourself on the mercy of Jesus and abandon your life to Him. He said His yoke is easy. His burden is light. Why don't you yoke up with Jesus and just see how great your life really can be? Too many times we spend so much time blaming others for our own problems. Deliverance comes from the Savior. If you're here today and you're not saved, or if you don't know you're saved, and let me help you something. If you don't know you're saved, then you're not saved. Because I remember the day I got saved. It changed my life. Been 47 years ago. You ask my wife, I can't remember anything unless I write it down, but I remember the day I got born again. Right. If you've never been delivered from your Egypt, if the blood is not over the doorpost of your heart, it can be today. In a moment, we're going to have an invitation, that beckoning, that swelling inside that causes you to ask those questions, am I saved? That can be answered today. Why don't you just come when we give that invitation. Step out. We'll get somebody to take a Bible, show you how to be saved. You can get born again today. I've already told you. All you got to do is believe on the Lord and turn from whatever it is you're holding on to and put it and give it to the Lord. Say, Lord, save me. He'll save you. If you're here today and you're saved, but you're in bondage. I mean, the Son has set you free. You're free indeed. How come you've been entangled back in bondage? I remember what Brother Greg Phillips says. He who angers you controls you. Uh, somebody on the job controlling you? Somebody at school controlling you? Somebody in the media controlling you? You can get set free from all that today. Why don't you come and let the one who delivered you from sin deliver you from your bondage? My dear friend, life's getting shorter. Jesus is coming. 
And he's coming looking for a bride without spot, without blemish. Are you in the family of God? And if you are, are you without spot? If not, why don't you get, why don't you get delivered today? Why don't you let God restore unto you the joy of his salvation? Why don't you let him do something great for you today? It could be a miraculous day in your life. All you got to do is say yes to Jesus. Let's all stand, Brother Ray, get a song of invitation. See, he's getting a song. Some are coming. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we love you. Thank you for first loving us. Thank you for the scriptures. Lord, in my heart, I believe there may be some here today who need to be born again. Why would you give me a message so clear on the topic if everybody was saved? Lord, I don't know the hearts of any of these folks. Lord, I don't even know my own heart. I just know you, and I appreciate that. But I'm fearful some don't know you today. Even right now, while we're praying, some are starting to have questions in their mind. Help them to realize that's the Lord between them. Help them to believe on the Lord. Help them to turn from whatever's holding them back and just give their heart and life to Jesus. Lord, I pray for your people. Some are in bondage today. Some need to uh, uh, come back to Jesus and let Jesus set them free. God, I pray you do a work around here today, a miraculous work. And I certainly pray, Lord, you'd save that one near his tail. Lord, have your will and way amongst us. Speak to hearts. We'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Do you struggle to find good Bible-based resources to supplement your personal devotions? If so, head on over to ibcflorence.com today and click on Bookstore, where we have a ton of resources. And as always, thanks for listening.